wasted some time. So let's start now. Uh, this, is, this talk is going to, uh, to be about the anatomy of a KMS driver. So I will start by quickly explaining what, a KMS, uh, what KMS actually is, because I, most of you probably have at least heard about KMS DRM, but might not know exactly what the difference between, between those is and what, what, exa <coughs> what exactly each API does, uh, does handle. Um, this will be fairly technical, so I will have to jump into code at some point because I really want to show you how you can write a KMS driver. Uh, so there will be kernel code, there will be C code. I apologize for that. Please try not to fall asleep at least too early. Um, if you do, if anyone wants me to, to kick him, if you fall asleep, just tell me beforehand. Um, okay, so starting with DRM and KMS. DRM is the uh, direct rendering manager. So that's a kernel to use space API and a kernel infrastructure that started as uh, a project to support GPUs in Linux. So it was mostly at that time of a 3D acceleration uh, and we needed an API to expose that to user space. So we already had the FBDEV API on the, on the kernel side to expose the, the, the display capabilities of the hardware. But for the 3D acceleration, we need something new to manage buffers, to manage the, to manage the memory, uh, to, to handle the common queues, uh, to be able to handle synchronization, uh, and all that went into KMS. That was quite a few years ago, um, and, uh, into DRM, sorry. That was quite a few years ago, and KMS didn't exist at that time. KMS stands for kernel mode setting. So it's a fairly recent addition to, uh, to DRM um, <coughs> that's aimed at moving all the mode setting code that lived in user space, so mostly in the X, X server back then. Uh, it aimed at moving that inside kernel space, inside the kernel drivers, so that you could actually control your display hardware and modify the display modes uh, from the kernel. Uh, there, there were many reasons to do that. One of them was to, uh, to be able to, uh, to control that from inside the kernel at boot time uh, when you want to have early display before X is available. Uh, another re reason was to actually arbitrate between the, the different uh, user space components that might want to control the hardware because when you, you go directly to, the, to your PCR hardware from user space uh, from the X server, then it becomes quite messy if you have different, uh, different components in user space that want to access that directly. So nowadays we have both DRM and KMS inside the kernel, uh, and both of them overlap. So <coughs> we have two APIs that are exposed through a single device, uh, and that are used by user space. Uh, and you cannot really use DRM without using KMS or the other way around. Um, we'll see that in a minute. So, as I mentioned, DRM handles mostly memory, vertical blanking, uh, and there's a couple of core tasks that nobody really wants to do because there's nothing fancy in that, but that needs to, uh, that needs to be available. So exposing like a version number to user space, exposing authentication features so that an unauthorized user space application will not mess up with the graphic hardware, handling uh, the maybe <coughs> multiple master uh, configuration when you, you want uh, a user space application to hand over control of the hardware to another one. So that's really core stuff that are quite boring. Uh, and I will not go into, into too many details uh, about them in this talk because those are ma mainly in DRM. That's something that the DRM car handles for you and you don't really have to, to care about that in your driver. On the KMS side, it's a bit more interesting, um, at least from my point of view because I've been working on that. Oh, that shouldn't happen. Okay. Right, okay. I have to stay close to the computer. Um, so KMS handles expose a device model um, to, uh, to your application and to user space. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute as well. It handles frame buffers. So a frame buffer is a memory object that you can use uh, to, to, uh, to give to your display hardware and it will, that will contain uh, information that you want to display on the screen so that it will be scanned out to the, to, to the screen. It handles mode setting, that's the kernel mode setting API, so that's more or less a given. Uh, it handles page flipping as well, 
Page flipping is a process in which you can atomically switch uh, between different frame buffers, between mem different memory reads, uh, to avoid uh, tearing uh, <coughs> when, when you want to display video, for instance. Um, it handles planes, overlays, uh, and handles many other small details that, uh, unfortunately, I will not have time to, to go into, <coughs> like uh, the uh, harder cursor, cursor, gamma <coughs> tables, things like that. Before diving into the kernel side, it's pretty important to, to explain what, uh, what a KMS define looks like and what the KMS model is, because that's really the core of the KMS operation, and you need to understand that both from the use base side and the kernel side uh, to, to understand how to write a kernel driver or how to write a, a KMS application in user space. So KMS handles five different kind of objects at its core. Uh, on the left, you have the memory objects. So I mentioned the frame buffer. A frame buffer is really a piece of memory in which you have graphics data that you want to push to the display. Um, that was the only memory object uh, available when KMS was created. Um, and the frame buffer is associated with a CRTC. So CRTC stands for CRT controller. Uh, there's probably no CRT anymore in use nowadays in uh, any kind of... Uh, of li Linux device, uh, but still the name, the name is still here. Um, so that's a piece of hardware that will get the, the pointer to your memory frame buffer, and that will scan the memory frame buffer out uh, of, uh, of the chip to an encoder. The encoder is then a piece of hardware that will take the digital signals that get out of the CRTC uh, and encode that to whatever format you need uh, for your display. So that could be analog on VGA, for instance, analog for TV. Uh, there are several different digital formats for HDMI, DVI, uh, for flat panels as well. So we have a diff different set of encoders. Some, encoders, some are, of them are really simple. They don't really need to be controlled. They just take digital signals on the input and will output signals that are compatible with a flat panel, and that's it. Uh, some of them are much more complex. So that's an object that's exposed by KMS API because it sometimes needs to be controlled precisely by user space. Uh, and then on the far right hand, you have the, uh, the connectors. Uh, we have to remember the KMS started as an uh, x86 a PC API in which you have a graphics card and you have connectors to, to get the signals out of the graphic cards. Uh, there's uh, usually no uh, embedded uh, LCD on the desktop. It's changed, obviously, with, um, uh, with netbooks. And, and so the, the model started with, uh, with connectors, uh, but a connector is, can actually be something that handles a uh, flat panel or any kind of display device. So it can be a physical connector, or it can just be uh, an interface on the bar to, uh, to the real flat panel. Um, so, just want to, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention about the planes. So, planes are a recent, uh, a recent addition to, uh, well, not that recent, but still, a uh, recent addition to KMS API. So, it's also memory objects, uh, exactly like frame buffer. Uh, but when you have a single frame buffer and you need to scan out, that was pretty much all that was supported by, uh, when we started by, by the hardware that we needed to support. Uh, <coughs> but some hardware can also have, uh, can overlay uh, other, other images on top of the main frame buffer. So that's what the planes are for. They're pieces of memory that you can give to the CRTC and that you can overlay on top of your main frame buffer. So you have support for, for different, uh, different hardware overlays. Um, if we had to redesign the API nowadays, we probably wouldn't separate the main frame buffer and the planes because there's no real difference between them except that the main frame buffer is at the bottom of the stack, uh, if you think about the, the Z order. Uh, but except for that, I mean, it's, it's a plain like the others. Uh, but for historical reasons, they're, they're currently separated. Uh, on, the, on the embedded side, well, memory is memory. There's no, no question about that. Uh, the CRTC is the, what you will have on your SOC. That's the graphic controller, the display controller on your SOC. For encoders, it's a bit of, uh, <coughs> of a mixed area. Uh, you can have the encoders inside your SOC, or you can have them outside on board. Uh, the connectors, obviously, are not part of the SOC. They are on the board and, uh, and off-chip. 
So that's, that's a pretty simple model. There are a couple of car objects. Um, they can represent more or less all that you have in nowadays hardware. Well, really more or less because we have some kind of cases today that uh, will be more common in the future. Uh, things like deep pipelining, for instance, when you have uh, a camera interface in your SOC that can deep pipeline data to, to, this, to your display controller, and that's support, not supported in this model. We have memory as inputs on the left. We don't have deep pipeline capabilities, for instance. So there are a couple of, of issues. We will need to extend that, but the, the, ba the basic model is, uh, is pretty simple. Um, the scanner process, as I mentioned, is about taking a frame buffer, so a piece of memory, uh, and pushing that to the display. So you, you don't need to use the whole frame buffer, actually. You can, you can use a part of the frame buffer. The frame buffer can be bigger than the display size, and you can take part of that and push that to the display. So that's, that's smaller, this kind of process. Uh, with, the, uh, with plane support, we have in KMS support for scaling the planes. That's not supported for the, the, the main frame buffer. Um, and KMS can compose that. So the composi composition model is not part of the KMS API. KMS will just know there's a mainframe buffer, there are planes I need to compose on top of that, and everything else, like configuring alpha blending, Z, the Z order, things like that, that's left to, uh, to drive a specific API. Uh, I mentioned the frame buffer. So frame buffer is, um, well, I said it's a piece of memory, but actually it can be a bit more complex than that. Because depending on your video format, you can actually have several pieces of memory. When you have a planner format, where well, you have an NV12 format, for instance, when you have one piece of memory with uh, the Y data and one piece of memory with the chroma data, then you have two separate memory arrays uh, that make your whole frame buffer. So the frame buffer in the KMS model has a couple of properties. It has a size, it has a pixel format to know what kind of data you have in there. Uh, it has pitches offsets. Uh, but very importantly, it has memory objects uh, that it uses to create that, uh, that whole frame buffer. So in the usual case, you will have a single memory object, but you can have, there are many cases when you need two. We could have formats where we need more than two, uh, two uh, memory objects. Uh, there's support for up, up to uh, four of them, I think, in the frame buffer API. Yep? So when you say format, do you, do you literally mean it's RGBA, it's YEV? Or exactly. Or is it, it's, oh, so it's not simply the case that it's single buffer, multi buffer, or whatever? No, no it's really uh, uh, RGB 16 bit with uh, 565, things like that. So it's a format uh, identifier that we have in the API in there. Uh, so, yeah, we support up to four memory objects. They showed here as GAM objects. So, GAM stands for Graphical Execution Manager. That's where it comes from, but Nowadays, in the embedded world, we use GAM as a memory manager, and it has no, no relationship with any kind of graphics execution. So when I'm talking about GAM objects, that's a memory object that's handled by the KMS API and by the DRM API. Uh, we have options to have different kind of memory objects, uh, but I will not go, uh, go into that because uh, that's n never used in, uh, in embedded drivers nowadays, and there's no reason for that anyway. Um, so um, a game object, that's, also n that's really the piece of memory. It's a linear piece of memory, uh, at least from a virtual point of view, virtual memory point of view. It also has a, sign, a size, it has a number of bits per, uh, per pixel, it has, uh, it has a pitch, uh, and it's associated with a piece of physical memory. Um, and several of those game objects are used to create, uh, to create a frame buffer. Um, briefly talk about handles. So when <coughs> the kernel driver will allocate the memory for you. So user space will ask for memory to be allocated depending on user space needs. Uh, but, uh, and then allocation is performed by the driver. When a game object is allocated by a driver on behalf of an application, the application has control on that object. But sometimes you want to actually share that object between several applications. Like you have an application that, would, that will allocate memory for a texture. Uh, you want to pass that to another application so that it will be filled. Um, so you need to be able to share those, um, <coughs> those pieces of memory between the applications. And you may also need to share them between different drivers. 
So when you create a game object in, user, in, in, in the kernel, you have local handle that's available to your application. That's just a number that's referenced the, the buffer. And then you can export that as global handle. So application can request a global handle. That's a file descriptor that's created behind the scene uh, for a give, uh, given game object. And when it gets that, you can, the application can send the file descriptor uh, to a separate application over Unix socket. So there's an API to do that uh, because you can, the file descriptor is just an integer that's local to an application. You cannot just send the integer value. That will not work. Uh, and one added benefit of that, that API is that uh, it's not possible for the other application to just guess the, uh, the ID of the, of the buffer. It needs to receive it explicitly. So we have embedded security in there, which means that if you have a buffer that you don't want to have exposed to any application that will contain sensitive data, and by sensitive data and graphics, we just we're just talking about copyrighted data, unfortunately. I mean, I don't really care about that myself, but so if we design an API and don't, don't support that kind of use cases, then the industry will not use it. So <clears throat> it's not possible for any user-based process to just go and access a buffer it doesn't have access to. It needs to be explicitly uh, allowed to do that by sending the, the buffer ID and the, the, buffer, the buffer handle to the application. And then you, the second process then can again go back to the kernel and take the, give the, the, file, the file descriptor to kernel driver and get back a local handle that it can use in all the APIs. Uh, briefly talk about the modes as well, the way we represent the mode. Um, <coughs> when you have a video that's displayed, um, you have horizontal and vertical synchronization signals. So you have a number of lines, uh, a number of pixels per lines, and at the beginning of a line, you will have a synchronization pulse over here. Then you have a viable delay, the start of the active area, then a viable inactive area here, and then you go back to the next line. And it's the same for vertical synchronization signals. So we have the sync uh, area. We have a delay that's called the back porch uh, because it's at the back of the, uh, of the sync. We have the active area of the image, and we have the front part, because if you think about it, the synchronization signals is reproduced here as well, so the front part is actually right in the front of the synchronization signal. <coughs> That's more or less what a display mode is. The way we represent that in KMS is that we actually move things around a bit, so you have your back part here, uh, your front part here, your synchronization, and then your back part. And we have four, uh, four values are used to represent the mode. So you have uh, the, the width of the active area, the position of the synchronization pulse start and end, and the total number of, uh, of uh, pixel clock pulses that you have on, uh, on a single line. It's the same for the, for the vertical synchronization. Um, and then last part of the, the model and the API that, it, that is exposed and we, we need to understand. Uh, is the mode setting API. KMS is about mode setting, so that's really the core of it. Uh, mode setting is about taking a frame buffer with uh, X and Y offsets inside the frame buffer with uh, the width and eighth of an active area in there, giving that to a CRTC to be scanned out on one or more connectors. Uh, and those connectors should be configured with a given video mode. So that's what the mode setting API does. You give all that information from user space and the driver needs to do the rest. And we'll now see how, how the driver actually handles that. There's documentation inside the kernel uh, documentation dogbook directory. Uh, it's not complete. Uh, it's better than it was a year ago because there was nothing a year ago. So it, the situation is definitely much better now. If you're going to write a KMS driver, read that documentation. Try to write the, co the code. And if there's something that's unclear in the documentation, something that's not complete, if you need to actually have a look in the code in the DRM car or in example drivers, then please contribute to the documentation. If the documentation is unclear enough, uh, I mean, I've, I've been working on KMS for some time now. There are things I know and understand because I'm familiar with them. Uh, but they might not be clear from the documentation. So if they're not clear for you, please tell me. Send a patch if possible, or just tell me that there's something that's not good with the documentation, and I will try to, to help with that. 
I'm going to dive into the code now. That's going to be the boring part of, this, uh, of the talk. Well, I hope you're not bored yet, otherwise it, this will be terrible. <laughs> um, I've omitted locking and uh, error and handling because otherwise it would be completely unreadable. Uh, don't do that in your code. Have a look at the drivers that we have in the kernel if you want to see uh, how errors are managed, how, how we need to handle locking. Uh, it's mentioned in the documentation as well. So just a uh, couple of conventions. Every function that will start by DRM and call, that's part of DRM call. Every function that will start by our car du, that's the driver I've used as a basis for, for this presentation. That's a Renesis uh, display unit driver. Uh, that's specific to the driver, so that you know which, uh, <coughs> what part of the code is implemented in DRM car and, car and what part is, uh, is implemented in the, in the driver itself. So we all start, well, you get your kernel module. Your kernel module is initialized. It probes your platform device, and we're talking about embedded devices here, so I'll talk about platform device case only. Uh, obviously, the support for PCI and USB KMS devices as well in the kernel, but that's not the topic of this talk here. So you have your, your platform driver, and you have your probe and remove functions. And in those functions, you just have to call DRM platform init and DRM platform exit, and that's it. Uh, so that's pretty easy. And you give to uh, those functions a pointer to a structure uh, that's a struct DRAM driver, and that will contain all information that uh, DRAM will need to, uh, to actually process all the use space calls and forward that to your driver. So let's get to that DRAM driver structure. Uh, there's lots of fields, so I'm going to present them uh, uh, as they used. Um, there's a couple of static information first. There's a flag field that is used to tell the DRAM car what your driver needs and what it can do. So you Probably, your driver probably need to have an interrupt, uh, otherwise it's a bit difficult to react to like vertical blanking events. so that's more or less something that you always need to do. Uh, you want to tell that your driver you the game memory manager, because there's no point in using another one. Uh, you want to tell that your driver can do mode setting. It's not an old legacy driver with the user space uh, access to the hardware from the X server, so you're using mode setting. And you also want to tell that it's using the Prime API. The Prime API is the API I talked about to, uh, that allows sharing buffers between different applications and different drivers. Um, <coughs> you just give a name to your driver, a description, a date. The date is actually supposed to, uh, to tell user space, report it to user space, and it's supposed to tell when the last update to the driver uh, happened. Uh, we all know that's something that you just write in your driver the first time, and then you always forget to, to update the date, so it's more or less pointless. Nowadays, it just tells when the driver was written for the, for the first time. You get a major, minor, and patch level version number. Um, patch level, that's something you always forget to, uh, to update as well. Major and minor are actually useful because your driver, the version of the, the driver API exposed to user space can change. So you have the KMS standard API, but you're allowed to expose private driver your controls. And at some point, you might decide that you need a new version of those. So you need to increase your minor number uh, when you make additions to your driver-specific driver API, so the user space will know about that. And you want to increase your major number when uh, you, you make modifications that are completely incompatible with the previous version. And the DRM call will handle that as a call to user space, from user space, and I want to use this API version, and the DRM call will, will handle that for you. Then you have the file operations. They're all that's quite usual, and that's quite easy in this case, actually. Uh, so in the, DRM driver, in the DRM driver structure, you have a pointer to file operations. And if you look at them, most of them, except the last one, they're calling DRM call functions. So you're allowed to over, override that. You're allowed to use your own functions if you need to. Uh, but except maybe for the compatible control that's used for 32 and 64 bit compatibility, you shouldn't need to do that. And even that, I mean, you, that probably mm, we will need to, to wait for um, uh, ARM64 to be, uh, to be used with KMS drivers before that's really useful. That's just the MMAP uh, file operation that you will need to implement yourself. We'll, we'll get to that. Then you have the load function. That's the main entry point of your driver. Uh, that's <coughs> something that the DRM call will call. So when, when we call DRM platform init, 
it will perform a couple of initialization in code. You load functions. So that's, that's a bit like a probe function in a, in a non-KMS driver. And in there, you will do all your driver your device specific initialization. Uh, you need to locate memory for your device for your uh, device private data. You need to uh, get the memory sources, the, the clocks, the regulators, everything that your device needs. That's where it's handled. Uh, that's pretty boring. That's definitely device specific. So I, I won't go into into details of what you <coughs> what needs to be done there. And you just store a pointer to your to your um, private data inside the dev private field of the DRM device. Then you want to handle uh, IQ registration. There's a helper function that helps you doing that in the in DRM. It will uh, it will get the IQ resource from the <coughs> for the platform resources. It will perform a couple of uh, couple of steps. So you just want to call DRM IQ install, uh, and that will do all the do all the magic. There's a caveat in that if you have more than one interrupt that's needed by your driver, you need to do it yourself. So that that only supports a single interrupt. Uh, you also have pre-install and post-install uh, callback functions that can be used, well, as the name implies, before and after installing the IQ handler. And in pre-install, they're, they're optional. If you use pre-install, you should make sure that uh, you will clear like interrupt flags there so that you will not have any spurious interrupts uh, that, that will be triggered. Uh, and in post-install, you usually want to enable the interrupts if needed. And there's obviously the IQ handler that you need to provide. <coughs> then we go, uh, we're going to uh, the mode configuration initialization. So KMS is about mode setting. Uh, and you need to call the DRM mode config init function. That's going to initialize, well, mostly all the lists, mutexes, everything that's needed by KMS internally. Um, just have to add that, and you have to fill a couple of fields with the minimum and maximum size of the frame buffers that you can support. So that's specific to your, to your hardware. You should know about that. And you also need to provide a pointer to a structure with uh, <coughs> mode config functions. And there's only one that's, uh, that I'm going to talk about here. That's the FB create function that is used to create a frame buffer. So from user space, application will ask your driver to create a frame buffer because it will want to put data in there and push that to the display. Uh, and that's a function that's called to create that frame buffer. Uh, and I'll explain uh, how, how that works. Um, we're using GAM, and because of that, uh, we have to fill the mmap file operation and two driver functions, uh, callback functions, to free uh, GAM object. And the other one is not a function. It's actually pointed to a structure with VM uh, virtual memory operations. <coughs> That's something you need to implement yourself, except if you can live with the helpers that we have in the kernel in KMS. We have lots of helper layers uh, that handles the complex tasks in most cases. So in most embedded cases, you will want to allocate your memory buffers uh, contiguously in memory uh, at least contiguously in the device memory space if you have an IMMU. And in that case, we have the DRM GAM CMA helper layer that handles all the memory uh, management for you. So you just give the pointer to uh, the structures and the functions uh, from the GAM CMA helper. CMA stands for contiguous memory allocation, but there's actually nothing that's specific in there to the CMA API. So behind the scene, it uses DMA alloc write combine. And if you want that kind of memory buffers, that's what you want, to, you want to use. If you have a more complex hardware with different requirements on memory management, then you will have to implement that yourself. But in most cases, that's really uh, the, the simplest solution. <coughs> Game has support for dub objects as well. So <coughs> if, if we look back at the previous slide, uh, you see that the operations can actually free an object, map it to user space, but there's no operation to allocate the object. That's because memory allocation was left to driver-specific APIs. The reason for that is was that on the, on the desktop world, uh, the memory allocation requirements really varied between the different, uh, the different devices. Uh, so that was left to a device-specific API. 
Uh, but then we realized that there was a uh, caveat with that, is that it was impossible to have a generic user space application that would be able to allocate memory. That's not really a problem when you have a complete graphics stack in user space with X away land because you will have user space drivers for that. Uh, but when you have like an early boot application that you want to display a splash screen, then you need to, you don't want in your early boot application to support all the different memory locations API possible. So <coughs> we've added in KMS uh, a dump memory buffer uh, allocation API that can be used to locate a, a memory object that can be used as a frame buffer so that you can push that to the CRTC and to, to be displayed. It cannot be used to allocate a memory buffer that's, uh, that's usable for uh, um, OpenGL texture, for instance, uh, but that's not, uh, that's not the topic of this talk. So uh, we, we have those three functions that are handled by the game CMA helpers to, uh, to allocate the memory for you. And if your hardware is just a display hardware uh, with, uh, without an integrated GPU, so if your GPU is a separate IP from uh, an SG GPU, a Mali GPU, whatever, uh, then that's what you want to use because all your display, all your display buffers, uh, they will be dumb buffers anyway. So there's no need to, to, add, to add anything there. Um, <coughs> last topic about game memory allocation. So that's something I mentioned, the Prime API to be able to share buffers. There are two functions that you need to implement. They call Prime Handle to FD and FD to Handle to convert a local handle to a global FD and a global FD to a, to a local handle. When you're using game objects, you just use two helper functions here. Um, <coughs> we'll always use game objects, so that's, that's just the function that you, you need to use. And those two functions will use we'll call the game prime import and game prime export functions uh, that are also provided by the game CMA uh, helpers. So all that is, uh, is handled for you. So <coughs> if we summarize that, uh, allocation of the buffers, mapping them to user space, freeing them, uh, exporting them, that's all handled by the, the helpers and there's nothing you have to do uh, for the memory management. <coughs> Frame buffer creation. Um, so <coughs> the FB create function, that's something that you need to implement in your driver. And what you need to do in there, when user space will request a frame buffer uh, creation, then it will pass several parameters like a frame buffer size, uh, pitches, uh, things like that. And you need to validate that. If user space asks for YUV frame buffer and your, your hardware can only do RGB, you need to, to validate that and return an error there. That's something that's driver specific, so you need to implement that. And when you're done validating the, the information, you can just call the DRM FB CMA create. That's a helper function that's also provided by the game CMA helper, and that will create the frame buffer for you with game CMA objects behind the scene. So all you need to do to create a frame buffer is to validate the parameters to make sure that they will work with your hardware, and that's it. <coughs> now we're getting to the CRTC. So the CRTC is the main piece of the display controller that will handle the scan out of the, of the, of the, the frame buffer to, you, um, to the display. You need at least one CRTC per, dri per driver. If there's no CRTC, there's nothing you can do with your device anyway. So you need at least one. <coughs> you need to create the CRTC. Uh, you can dynamically allocate that. You can embed that in a bigger structure. It can be embedded in new driver private data, whatever. Uh, but you need to have a, a pointer to a DRM CRTC and initialize that and pass a pointer to a structure with CRTC functions. So the, f the first one, uh, I'll mention the other one afterward. The first one is the destroy function. Um, KMS manages the life, the lifetime and the life cycle of all the objects I mentioned. So your driver doesn't need to care about reference counting the object itself. That's KMS, that's KMS job, that's a core job. Uh, and when an object is not needed anymore, then the destroy function will be called. So there's a function provided by the car that's just DRMCRTC cleanup that will perform the exact opposite of DRMCRTC init function. <coughs> if your CRTC is embedded in a bigger structure and you want to free that or you want to uh, clean up uh, anything you've done at any time, then you can provide your own function and call DRMCRTC cleanup yourself. The encoders, well, it's pretty similar. You initialize your encoder. Uh, with functions, there's a destroy function. 
the encoder has a list of possible CRTC it can be connected to. So you have a single CRTC, a single encoder, it's pretty easy. Uh, when you have multiple of them, you just have to tell, okay, this encoder on the board can be connected to only the first CRTC or the first and the second CRTC. Uh, that's just a bit mask of the CRTCs. Uh, and you have to tell about the encoder type. So in this case, that's, uh, <coughs> that's for a VG encoder, so it's a digital to analog converter. Uh, and there's a list of types that are defined in the API. And then you have to initialize your connectors. Uh, so you also have a connector init function. You have uh, uh, connector functions that you need to provide. And it's a bit more complex for the, the connector because you need to attach that to an encoder. So every connector needs to be attached to uh, one or several encoders. Um, otherwise, it's, if it's not attached to anything, it's just useless. Um, when you have a simple hardware with a one-to-one -one mapping between encoders and connectors, like you have this encoder that's always connected to one connector, then that's pretty easy. You can just attach them at initialization time. If you have one connector that can actually be attached to different encoders, uh, not at the same time, obviously, then you need to manage that at runtime. Um, and yeah. <coughs> mode setting then. That's the most interesting part. So as I mentioned, mode setting is about <coughs> telling a CRTC, here's a frame buffer that I want you to scan out, here's an offset inside the frame buffer, and here's, here's the mode that I want to have on the connectors. So there's a single function in the CRTC function that's called setconfig that takes a DRM mode set structure pointer and that lists all those, uh, those information. It's fairly complex actually because you need in your hardware, in your, in your driver, um, to validate all the parameters, uh, to handle the states of uh, the CRTC, the encoder, all the pieces of the hardware. Um, and yeah, that's something that, that can be a big piece of code. Uh, but in most of the cases, uh, we can actually break that in simple operations, and we have a helper layer inside KMS that can be used to do that. So you can use the DRM CRTC helper set config function uh, as a handler for the set config operation. And then you just need to install by calling the helper add functions for the CRTC connector and encoder, uh, helper function callbacks. You cannot just use the helpers for the CRTC and the encoder and not the connector. It's either all of them or none of them, but if you use that helper function, and you should use that, otherwise it's really pretty complex, uh, you, you need to install the helper functions for, for all of those. Uh, the helper functions on the CRTC side is quite a couple of them. Uh, the first one would be mode fix up. <coughs> User space want to uh, display that mode and kind of hardware support that. So that's what the function does. It will take the mode as a parameter, parameter and check if, if it can be supported by the CRTC. If it cannot, it's rejected. If it can, but with minor tweaks like um, pixel clock frequency modification and things like that, then the mode will be fixed up. It will be mod modified slightly. When that's done, uh, the prepare function of the CRTC is, is called, and that's really device-specific. That's why you should perform any, perform any device-specific operation that needs to be done before setting the mode. And usually that's disabling uh, the CRTC and the, and the output. Then we have the mode set function that is called with a new mode. That's where you reprogram the, the hardware. And there's the commit function that is called at the end, uh, where you should apply all the settings to the hardware and just enable the CRTC again. And then you will, you will have your, your new mode uh, set up. There's a mode set base function uh, that <coughs> is a simpler version of mode set. And that's used when you don't want to do a complete mode set, but just want to change a frame buffer. So you have a bigger frame buffer, and you want to pan into that. If you want to change, just change the offset, there's no need to disable the output and re-enable that. That would just make the screen flicker. And so mode set based in that case is called, uh, and the prepare and commit functions are not called. So it just sets the offset, the base, the base address in memory from which you want to scan out. And lastly, it is the disable function. Uh, that's called to disable the CRTC. So when you use a space when to disable the, the output, that's the function that it gets called. So all that needs to be implemented in the driver. It's usually s simple code, uh, at least for most of them. Uh, the mode set function that will reprogram all the register, that might be a bit complex depending on your hardware complexity. 
uh, but it's still split into fairly simple uh, functions. Then you also have those helper functions for the, for the encoder uh, and for the connector. There's also a mode fix-up function for the encoder because the encoder can have different, different mode requirements than the CRTC. There's a pre prepare and commit function and a mode set function. And for the connector, there's just a best encoder fun function. If we go back to uh, the, the mode set API, you see that there's a list of connectors that are given. Uh, and so your driver needs to find out which encoder to use between the CRTC and the connectors that, you want to, that we want to use. And that's the, what the best encoder uh, function will do. In most cases, when your connector are just connected to a single encoder, you return a pointer to that encoder and you're done. Mode setting is nice, but you also want to discover the modes. You want to be able to list from user space the mode that is supported by your display. Uh, and that's done by a connector function. Uh, because modes are handled at the connector level. That's why your display is plugged in. Uh, and that's a field mode function. So the field mode function will take a pointer to the connector, a maximum width of an eighth. So you, and it needs to filter all the modes that are larger than that and fill uh, the connector structure with a list of the different modes as supported. There's also a helper for that. You can use the help, help, helper probe single connector modes. That's a bit long. Uh, and provide two helper functions, get modes that will uh, give a list of all the modes supported by your, by your display, uh, and then the car will handle all the filtering uh, for all the features, that, all the modes that are bigger than maximum size are not supported for different, different reasons. And then there's a mode valid function uh, that is used to uh, actually validate a mode that, uh, that, that, you, that you want to set to make sure that the connector can use that. So that's pretty simple as well. Uh, DPMS, DPMS is about power management and display. So that's a pretty old standard that defines four different power manage power states for the uh, for display device. So you have the on state, that's pretty easy. Uh, you have the off state, that's easy as well. It's completely off, it draws uh, the least uh, possible power. And you have two intermediate states that are standby sus in suspense state. Uh, they draw less power than on, so the, the power consumption decreases when you go down. Uh, but the time it takes to recover from uh, standby or suspend uh, or off increases uh, when you go down as well. So when your display is off, the specification actually allows, I think it was in the original version, up to 10 or 30 seconds for the display to come up, which is, uh, according to today's standards, that's uh, insane. Um, so we still have those four power states in the API, uh, and that's handled at a connector level. So from user space, you want to tell, okay, on this connector, for this screen, I want to put it in standby or in suspend. I want to turn it on and off. And there's a, a function that you need to implement there. But that function will need to touch the, the, uh, the, the encoder connected to, to uh, the connector and also the CRTC. If you want to turn all the displays off, you want to turn your CRTC and all the hardware off as well. So there's a helper layer for that as well. There's a function called DRM helper connect to DPMS. You should use that. And that relies on DPMS callbacks on both the CRTC and on the encoder. So the function will, for instance, if you have two encoders connected to one CRTC, uh, so you, can, you have cloned displays, you want to turn one of them off, you still want the other to be on. You turn the second one off, then at that point you can uh, disable completely your display, uh, your display device. And that's what the car the handles. It will check what's used in the whole pipeline and then call the two callback functions uh, to set the power state on the encoders and on the CRTCs. Vertical blanking, that allows tier free rendering, so it's pretty important. That needs to be initialized at load time, and it takes an, the number of CRTCs available into, in, your, in your device. Then in your intrap handler, you need to call DRM <coughs> handle vblank with the CRTC number, um, and that will account for the vblank interrupt. Counting vblank interrupts sounds like something pretty simple, uh, but you need to make sure that it's race free. Uh, that you will handle the counter wraparounds. Uh, there are many small KVATs that actually make it pretty complex. So the DRM car handles that for you, uh, and you just have to call this DRM handle vblank function. And there are three func functions that you need to implement in your driver. 
the, uh, the enable V-blank, disable V-blank that will enable and disable the vertical blanking interrupt. Uh, and there's a, there's a v get V-blank counter. So if your hardware has a, uh, if your device has, uh, has a hardware V-blank counter, that's the function you need to implement to return the value of the counter. If it doesn't, you just use the DRM V-blank count function as the handler, and that will uh, handle everything for you behind the scene and count the interrupts. Page flipping. <coughs> Page flipping is taking another piece of memory giving it to the CRTC to replace the frame buffer being scanned out, and you want that to be down at the vertical blanking time so that you get no tearing uh, on, the, on the screen. So the page flip function <coughs> uh, is the function that you need to implement to uh, set a new frame buffer for the CRTC. Uh, for the, the, the CRTC. Um, it takes a pointer to the new frame buffer you want to use, pointer to CRTC, and a pointer to a V-blank event. If there's already a page flip queued, then you need to, to tell I'm busy. KMS, the KMS API only supports queuing one page flip, and you need to wait until it's down before queuing the other one. Then you do whatever you need uh, for, your, for your device to handle that. And if there's an event supplied by the application, then you enable the V-blank, uh, the V-blanking in uh, interrupts to uh, report the page flip completion to user space when it will be done. So page flip completion will be done at interrupt time. So when you get your V-blank interrupt, you have to uh, implement a piece of code that will fill the event uh, structure with a sequence number. There's a helper function to get that. A timestamp also from the helper function. Then you add that to, to, a, to a list of event, wake up uh, the car, and then disable the vertical blanking interrupts. All the vertical blanking interrupts are reference counted, so the DRM V blank get and put uh, can be called from your driver from the DRM car, and you will only be asked to enable and disable the interrupt when there's no user or when there's a new user. Planes, that's the last topic, I think. <coughs> so it's a bit similar to the CRTC uh, frame buffer API. Uh, you create a plane. You give it a list of CRTC it can be associated with. Uh, that's a bit mask. You give it function pointers and a list of formats that the plane can support. So that's really the, uh, the list of all the formats that are defined by DRAM and that, uh, that you, you hardware can use. Um, then you need to provide three callback functions. There's still a destroy function that's pretty usual. And a plane update and plane disable functions. Plane update is the function that is called when you want to, when user space want to enable a plane, want to enable an overlay, or change the overlay parameters. It takes lots of parameters. It takes the plane, the CRTC, the frame buffer. It takes an offset in the CRTC uh, with an eighth. It takes an offset in the, in the frame buffer with an eighth as well, so it can handle scaling. Um, and then you need, just need to program your hardware to do that. There's a plane disable function that's called when user space want to turn off an overlay, and you just have to turn it off there. There's much more than that. I haven't mentioned the properties. Properties are an API that can be used to expose any kind of device-specific properties to user space. Uh, so that's how you can extend a KMS API. There's an FB dev emulation layer I haven't mentioned. There's a connector status polling system that I haven't mentioned either uh, that can be used to report hot plug events to user space. Uh, there's an atomic page flip um, <coughs> API that can be used to actually do page flip on CRTC and on planes at the same time. Otherwise, when you have an overlay that's moving in, inside your, your, main, uh, your main frame buffer and you want to draw a border around that, so you have your overlay that displays the video and the border is displayed on the main frame buffer, you need to keep them in sync. If you don't, don't do that atomically, then they will move slightly. Um, so all that is not mentioned in this talk. Some part of uh, those topics are available in documentation I mentioned. Uh, not all of them because we need to, we need to complete the documentation. Uh, so if you're using any of those, and if there's no documentation, please send a patch. Uh, what's coming next? Well, there's one pretty important topic, which is the generic display framework. It started a generic panel framework to uh, have a single framework to uh, expose the single API so that you can write panel drivers in a device independent way. Uh, it's 
grew more or less in a generic display framework that can be used to support not only panels but encoders as well and different pieces of hardware than you have in your, your display pipeline. Uh, it's still not done yet. There's a buff session tomorrow at 4 p.m. So if you're interested in that, Jesse is, has been kind enough to organize that. So that will be just brainstorming and getting feedback from uh, everybody to, to make sure that all the use cases we have will be supported. Uh, in a nutshell, if I, yeah, 30 seconds. <laughs> That's the idea behind the display fr framework. So you have a single panel driver. Uh, that needs to communicate with the display controller that has an underlying control bus that it uses to, to talk with the panel. It gets video from the display controller, so it needs to control the video stream as well. Uh, and so it sits in the middle of lots of blocks, and we want to make something that's extensible and that will uh, cover the panel use cases, but also the encoder use cases when you have like a more complex chain uh, with really a display panel at the end, but different encoders in the chain all that needs to be handled somehow uh, as well. Most of the use cases I've been told about are more theoretical use cases. Uh, some of them are real. We're not sure yet how complex we'll make the API at the moment. So that's something that will be discussed in a row. Contact information, mailing list, my email address.